Here, Here it comes. Good evening. It is 5 o'clock, so I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order of the uh, Committee for Parks, Recreation, Human Services, and Public Safety. Uh, I am uh, Jack Walsh, the, the committee chair. Uh, we have with us committee member uh, Lydia Asafadasan, and we would uh, ex uh, excuse uh, committee member Erica Norton, who is unable to be here with us this evening. We recognize uh, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Susan Honda and Council Chair uh, Linda Kochmar and Council Member Jack Dovey here with us as well. Uh, and we uh, welcome the, the, the public here also. Uh, we will begin with public comment and I understand that there are some uh, public comment. We have Deanna Riddle. Deanna Riddle. All right. Yes, go, go over there and uh, just state your name once again and, the, and uh, the city that you live in. And go ahead, and you will have uh, three minutes for public comment. Okay. My name's Deanna. Um, I'm here to address the Steel Lake Annex uh, situation where it's pro being proposed to take away the park and put in maintenance and facilities. And um, I'd just like to address my feelings towards that. Um, I recognize that there is reason to consider it because of savings of cost. Um, but I say that it would cost a whole lot more for the public, um, for the public, in places to be, in green places, and for air, and for kids to run free, than it is for to build a maintenance park uh, and take over that park area. Um, I also recognize that there was a statement at the last meeting, the last council meeting, that said that it hasn't been utilized very much. But I'd also like to say that you know there was COVID for two and a half years, so nothing was utilized very much, including the civic center. Um, and that so some of the statistics about using f the field were not really very accurate. And even if that were true, I think there's a real opportunity here to re-envision a park where even more people could use the park than what do now for the fields if, if that were true, uh, that kids and people uh, uh, would go to play and enjoy themselves with even more apartments buildings coming up, more people coming into the city. Um, you may have seen in the Seattle Times about how four other cities have been re-envisioning their parks and inviting more and more people to really experience um, what a park is where kids can really play and enjoy themselves. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. Uh, is there any more additional public comment? No. Okay. All right, let's go to the uh, next item on the agenda, which is the approval of the June 14, 2022 minutes. I move to approve. And I second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. <laughs> okay. All right, next uh, a report on the uh, PAC operations by uh, Autumn Gresset, and it looks like that uh, that Brian is here with us also. Good evening, Council Members, Deputy Mayor, Council President. As you guys know, Brian Hoffman is our General Manager at the Performing Arts and Events Center, so I'm going to let him take the lead on his reports for you guys and follow up with any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. 
Um, here to report on our June um, operations at the PAC. Um, our, we will be reporting on our events that were held in June. However, the financial information for May. We do have a little bit of a lag with the finance, finances. So um, really, uh, we had uh, submitted a, hint, a bunch of information to you, just kind of highlight a couple of uh, a couple of those things, we actually, um, in early June, we had the Washington Wrestling Hall of Fame induction ceremony, first time it was held at the PAC. Had a little bit of uh, over about 400 people throughout the state, um, and very, very well received, loved the space and the hotel accommodations, um, and we are currently working on uh, a multi-year agreement with that organization um, to have their annual induction ceremony here in Federal Way at the PAC. Um, Third time we held a Native Comedy Jam. Um, each um, time we have that, uh, we kind of continue to exceed expectations and almost another sellout um, on June 18th. And then had um, three or four good of uh, what we, uh, our food and beverage or meeting space events. Uh, we had Goodman Real Estate, which finally, um, after three tries with COVID, we had their annual uh, banquet and celebration uh, with a little over 200 people. They had four different breakout rooms. Uh, we provided um, a light breakfast, lunch, all day snacks. They did everything from yoga to um, packing uh, a little over 400 school bags for local um, organizations. So um, that was really well received and uh, the staff did a tremendous job in regards to that. Um, and then uh, just kind of some overall operational um, items. We have um, finalized our art exhibit with the plants um, and uh, finally got that um, situated. Uh, our landscaping throughout the property is about 95% complete um, as of uh, this afternoon with the walkthrough. Um, we just have irrigation being installed on 314th, kind of that uh, right away. I don't know the correct term, but um, <clears throat> surrounding that property and then flowers or additional plants um, will be arriving Monday. And then um, the right of way down PVR to 312th, kind of the L um, as I call it. There's probably a better name for it, but the L uh, on the wall uh, with that um, weeds and those types of things. So um, we did have a little bit of um, continued vandalized um, things. Uh, so some of our bistro tables uh, were, were uh, damaged. And then uh, an individual, the same individual that vandalized uh, the bistro table also um, decided to practice his baseball skills with a handful of those 2,800 plants that we had. Um, so we continue to um, work with our private security company um, on that. Um, at the end of the day, it really boils down to money. Um, we we uh, are working on a proposal for 24-hour security at the PAC um, with a private security company, and it's in excess of $100,000. So um, just, um, you know, we have the cameras, um, but unfortunately that, um, you know, it's a little difficult to catch them afterwards. Uh, we do fill out the, um, I'll call it the report or what have you on the City of Federal Way website um, in case there's an incident. So, um, but we just do the best that we can to protect the uh, asset of the city and um, those belongings there. Um, we had some more graffiti. Um, as you, all you folks know, ongoing issue with shopping carts um, throughout the city and on our property as well. So, um, and then um, into the financial um, areas, uh, we did based on uh, last month uh, in our, our packet, we compared May of 2019 pre-pandemic to where we are today. Um, so a little bit better in actually all of the categories. Um, the total rehearsal days were a little less. Um, in 2019, we had Jet City's choir chorus that was a resident artist group. Uh, they were rehearsing every Monday at the PAC. They no longer rehearse at the PAC um, at this time. That was based on their MOU. Um, that the city uh, entered in in 2017. Um, and then um, July, a lot of ongoing projects with um, kind of our summer projects as we call them, stripping and uh, painting of the stage, 
the interior seating area, um, touch up paints throughout um, the facility. Uh, we did have a concert scheduled for July 2nd. Um, that has been postponed to September 24th. And then um, we have the primary elections, um, King County primary elections coming up at the end of the month. So happy to answer any questions. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the art display. We've been waiting a long time for that to be redone and it looks really pretty, so thank you very much. And I have a question about the, the weeds along um, the wall. So that those will be done, that will be weeded all along the wall and up um, PBR way? Yes, from the staircase on 312th going towards PBR and then that corner from that intersection up to the PAP property that will be. How much of that, uh, the stuff that's there, it are weeds and how much are will remain will you need to replant anything there um i'm not sure um we once the landscapers kind of get in there so to speak um we'll see what it looks like and um if there's any additional planting um that will have to be done we will uh cross that bridge when we come to it okay well thank you very much and i really appreciate it um so i appreciate that but it was not me it was a great team effort and the partnership with the PAC, Oakview Group, and the city, specifically Autumn and John and the Parks Department. So um, a lot of help from them, so I can't take all the credit. Well, thank you to all who did who did work on it. it um, it's, it's very pretty, and I hope it grows and becomes what the artist envisioned. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Sefa Dotson. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, in the events that you listed um, where you participated, you did not list um, LTAC meeting? Correct. So, but um, my question is, Arts for Youth uh, matinees, mm -hmm. you said, why are we tracking it or is that something that we plan on doing sometime? Yeah, we, we've always tracked that. Um, unfortunately, during COVID, we did not have them. Um, and we plan and are in the process right now of finalizing the Arts for Youth program um, for the 2022-2023 school year. So that um, the Arts for Youth program is in partnership with the um, Federal Way Performing Arts Foundation. Uh, they subsidize um, the buses and some most of the tickets for Federal Way school students to come. Um, on a non-COVID year, uh, we have approximately six to seven student matinees, um, close anywhere from three to 4,000, or excuse me, about 3,500 to 4,500 students come through our doors from September through um, May to uh, experience live entertainment. In addition to that, um, we have a staff member um, that goes into the schools and works um, with study guides. And so say we have a science um, performer, they will go in to the schools leading up to that and talk about what things you can do with science and the fun things that are related to science and then be able to see that live on stage and in person. So um, this was just something that, again, that we continue to track and will continue to track as it's part of the overall mission statement of the PAC and the foundation. So we won't expect to have anything during the summer? Not during the summer, no. So it'd be probably October, maybe? October, yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right, uh, Council President uh, thank, Kochmar. Thank you, um, Brian, for your presentation. I'm so sorry about the vandalism. Do you know, do you know if that were kids or adults that were? Uh, I looked like an adult, a young male. Hmm. Um, so are we, um, this is um, wedding season. Are we doing any marketing for weddings? Uh, we have a little bit. Um, and this year, we haven't done as much as we should have. Um, we do have some weddings, um, and we are, as you folks know, uh, part of the budget process to ramp that up um, in the coming years, in 2023 and 2024. Um, we average maybe one to two weddings um, you know, a month, give or take. Um, but um, you know, it just, we, we have to do a better job of marketing you know, the weddings. The biggest thing that we get um, from the wedding perspective is that folks want to bring in their own caterer. 
was going to be my question. Is that a problem? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, we have exclusive catering at the Performing Arts Center. Um, a couple of reasons is that uh, it, you can control um, the product that you're putting out, and it's number one, it generates more revenue to the city. Thank you. Uh, so next year we're going to ramp up earlier because obviously the wedding season will start in January, February with conventions and people at the convention center where they go to the wedding. Correct. Now that people are out of COVID and, and mm -hmm. so by April it's going to be in full swing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Council member yeah. Seth Nelson. No, I think it's around catering and I, um, or ethnically relevant type of food, which you, you, I'm sorry, the foods that your caterers cannot make. Mm -hmm. Is there would there be some kind of a consideration? Uh, we do look at that on a case by case ba basis. Um, if it's something that's uh, very authentic, uh, we will work with our executive chef and the client or the event planner to um, you know either do a tasting. Um, that we will uh, offer to them, or it's a partnership of um, bringing in maybe somebody, uh, another uh, sh executive chef within our organization that has um, experience in that specific uh, culture or what have you. And then if, if neither of those work, then we will work with them on um, you know, bringing in a, another chef or some type of outside catering. I think in the four years that I've been here, that happened once. So there's an opportunity if people want to try it. Or there is, yes, and, and we have a vast, um, I, I call it a bench of you know, chefs within our company that we can pull from. Um, there's five of them here in Washington alone, um, from Climate Pledge Arena to Angel of the Winds Arena to Green River College to Yakima, um, and then down in Portland, et cetera, that have, uh, if our specific chef here does not have that experience, somebody does. Thank you. All right. Hey, uh, first, uh, Council Member Dovey, and then Council President Hunt, uh, yeah, um, Coach Mark. I have a question. You just struck to my brain when you talked about weddings. Um, in a perfect world, assuming there were, how many weddings could we support at the center in a month? Or has anybody done that study or what that looks like? 31. 31? One a day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and if it's a smaller wedding, you could, okay. theoretically, my staff okay. would not like it, we could do two in a day. <laughs> okay, so so that's a number. So you made the comment, it was asked about th the food. Mm -hmm. Has there been a study of uh, how much revenue we lose because we don't do 31 weddings because we charge for food, or is there a break point where the revenues, you know, if we were more flexible on that, where we would actually make more money than doing two weddings and charging for the food and maybe doing 15 weddings and charging a nominal food fee for people to bring their own food? Has um, there any studies been done on that or just? I don't, I don't know if you're at the PAC. Um, I believe with our 400 plus properties across the U.S. and Canada, yeah. I'm sure one of those other facilities have done a study mm -hmm. um, that I could probably get my hands on. Um, you know, with, um, you know, allowing outside caterers, you. you you basically lose control. It's costing you more money. You know, you get a small percentage, but we as a facility um, have the wear and tear of the, of the venue. They're using all of our products. They're using our water. They're using our electricity. Um, they leave the building a mess or what have you, the kitchen a mess. They break, you know, the equipment. That falls back onto uh, us as the venue operator for um, maintenance, repairs, those types of things. Um, and, you know, you lose, uh, in, in my opinion, consistency of having, you know, the same quality product, the quality great service and experience when you can control that. I, I, I mean, one last comment, having paid for two weddings, um, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's not an inexpensive venture for most families. Or, mm -hmm. And it, I'm just suggesting, and you're the experts, you probably have the studies, but you know, if you cover, if people pay for all those things that could happen, breaking, wear and tear, because we had to do all that, and and we chose who we wanted to come to the venue, 
I mean, there might be a break point where everybody makes more money and we get more people there and it might be something to look at. Just as we're going into budget season, it would be nice to know. Yep, we can take thank, a look at it. But thank you. All right. And just to add, I support that idea because um, there's been several Ethiopian weddings across from you at the Punjab Palace. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, initially he was not allowing outside catering or he was splitting the, um, you know, like almost, what is it, like half or whatever. And now he's just allowing it, but his rental, it goes up slightly when we don't, when people don't purchase food from him, so. Yeah, and we have that flexibility where it's kind of a sliding scale based on what your food and beverage minimum or gross revenues would be. You get a better deal on the rent because the margins in food and beverage are much greater. Yeah, but he's allowing it now because he's noticed that there are things he just can't do, but he wants the space to be rented out, so. And he's right around the corner from you, so there's yeah, a competition they, right there. I wish I had a dollar for every car that parked there that was attending an event over there. Well, it, it, l let me make a comment on this, and then uh, uh, with with my business, I um, work with probably at least two dozen different venues, and have catered ice cream at three or four hundred weddings mm -hmm. over the years. And uh, what many of the venues do is, is to prevent problems like, like what you're stating with breakage and stuff like that. They'll have a, just a small handful of, of preferred caterers mm -hmm. where, they, where they know the caterer, they know, what they, they, they know that they're responsible. Uh, I think that at, some time, at times they've, uh, I, I'm not certain on this, but I think it's, at times they've had, uh, had them do some type of bond also. To, to protect them in that in that area, and uh, uh, the the majority of the venues in the area that are booked the most, that are booked closer to those 31 days. I mean, th there, there's no venues out there that are booked 31 mm -hmm. days, but there's a lot of venues that, especially during the summer months, are are booked every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and typically one weekday as well, and uh, and most of them do do allow selective. Uh, caters in. So I, I think it would be a good idea to, as Council Member Dovey said, to take a look at that and see just what uh, what the the uh, the breakdown would be on cost. And it, it may be, end up uh, being more profitable to allow some outside catering, uh, of course, charging more if they're using their own caterer as well. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, I know um, prior to Spectra, this, the PAC specifically, I can't speak on that. I wasn't here. Um, I know, I don't want to speak for her, but Autumn was. Um, that they, that's how the PAC was set up before. Um, so I don't know if you want to. In my experience and my years in catering and events, I have been on both sides of being in a venue that runs catering um, exclusively, being in a venue that runs outside caterers, also being on the caterer side. Um, there's lucrative opportunities for all. The thing with the pack that I found and being here since 2017 um, when we opened the building is that being able to provide quality consistency um, with an all-inclusive venue management company has provided a more than excellent um, experience for all of our patrons. One of the things that it lends the hand to is they have resources, as Brian said, throughout the nation and our region that can kind of tap into that, but they're not unflexible if they really get down to the bottom line and somebody needs something. Um, I would venture to say that we would love our clients to ask the question versus assuming that there isn't any flexibility, right? We want to do our best to provide a phenomenal service. And the other thing that having exclusivity lends its hand to um, that I experienced at the beginning of 2017 is without having exclusivity for food and beverage, your ability to staff your um, venue is very minimal. Um, the PAC is currently only operating with five full-time staff members, and they do everything from set up, tear down, food and beverage, operations, you name it, they're doing it, and they're working long hours. So if we take away some of that exclusivity, it takes away the ability and the financials to be able to have those five full-time staff. I do agree that it's probably worth looking at just to know what all of our options are, but I do want to um, also keep in mind that our building over the last four years has <coughs> been 
and has had significant growth even through COVID. So I see the lucrative opportunities in all of them. It just may not be the perfect fit for the pack, and we may need to find a happy medium in some of the things that you guys have mentioned, you know, other um, patrons or whatnot wanting to use the venue, and maybe they don't know that we have flexibility if they have the conversation with Brian, that kind of thing. If that helps right. answer some of those questions. Okay. All right, thank you, Autumn. Uh, Council President uh, Coachmore. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is a question for Autumn or for um, John, but you know, I, with, when we're discussing the budget, do we have, for example, we have three venues that people can use for weddings. There's the community center, the PAC, and the uh, Duma Space Center. And so do we have a coordinator? On, look, if I'm going to come and I'm going to say, hey, what does the city bedway have to offer? And I know the PAC is a little more expensive than other venues. Do we have somebody that actually will talk to people or have a website that says we also have the community center, we also have the, for example, if I want to have a, a, a reception somewhere else, but the wedding at Duma Space Center, do we have anybody that can explain how that would work? Or do we have a price breakdown between the two? Yes, we have, we have rental experts at each facility. So we have a rental coordinator at the community center. We have Duma Space staff that takes care of their own rentals and the pack. And they all would work together in that scenario that you just put out there. If someone wanted to do a wedding at Dumas Bay, but their reception at the community center, we would just coordinate those two people together and work with them. So yes, we can, we can absolutely do that. Yeah, I just want to make sure that when they're calling that they get referred to, you know, if they say, well, it's too expensive, that they get referred to the community center or the Dumas Absolutely. Bay. We all work together in a team to try and keep yeah. that that yeah. uh, you know, customer maybe, happy in federal sure. way maybe that one of our three sites be one of our, our um, uh, impetus for the budget next year is to talk about how to market the three venues in the wedding planning arena sure. yeah yeah we need to bring in more revenue uh, <laughs> <laughs> we need turf fields at celebration Park. <laughs> yes, we <do. laughs> weddings on the turf there you go yeah. thank you oh. uh, yeah I, I would like to to see more uh, more uh, work with marketing as well. I attend many uh, wedding shows, many uh, event shows. For example, at the, just a few months ago at the Northwest Event Show uh, in, in, uh, in Seattle, uh, there were a lot of other munici municipalities that had, had booths there that were getting, uh, picking up a lot of, of uh, leads. And, and we here in Federal Way, we're not, we're not there. And I think that it's a mistake not to be participating in some of those. And, and with those, it could be all three venues. I mean, having one booth promoting Federal Way and the, the various venues uh, with that. And I, I think that it may be a, a mistake not doing that. Uh, typically, uh, uh, you know, it costs a, a couple thousand dollars to, to be in the shows. And, and I think it would be money well spent that would have a, a very good ROI. So. We have attended the wedding shows several okay. times. We've had different people go. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone in a few years, obviously, since COVID, uh, yeah, but right. we have absolutely attended the mm -hmm. wedding show in Seattle. So, but yeah, I, I think that the, now that the Tacoma wedding show is no more, at least for now. I don't know whether it'll come back or not. Uh, but the Seattle wedding show, also the Northwest event show, uh, the, the Northwest Event Show is, is, is really the one that I would most highly recommend. Uh, with the wedding shows, it's, it's brides and typically brides and their moms, and it's a, a one-time thing, where with the uh, Northwest Event Show, it's event planners who can be repeat business at time and time and time again. And so I would highly encourage the, the, you all to take a look at the Northwest Event Show this next year. I have a question. Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. Uh, so I was going to bring up Dumas Bay and a community center for weddings, but when we, when someone approaches us about doing a wedding, do we let them know that at the PAC there is, or, or any event at the PAC actually, that there is an option to call in different chefs? Because I've had a couple groups, probably three groups, tell me they didn't go to the pack because they couldn't get the food that they wanted. They wanted either Korean food or, or something else. And they never mentioned to me that they were given an option of having another chef come in. Is that something that we advertise that we will work with uh, with you with what you want on your meal? 
we don't advertise it, but as we're going through the booking process, um, we do have those conversations with that particular individual. You know, we have a, um, a standard menu or a menu that they can choose from. It's always reiterated to that client that if there's something on the menu that you don't see or a specific um, item that you're looking for, please let us know. We will work with our culinary team to, um, you know, make that happen um, within reason, uh, those types of things. So, yes, we do have those conversations um, with each particular client. But we don't advertise it anywhere other than when they're talking to you. They Correct. actually have to reach out. Correct. All right, thank you. All right. Council Member Dobie. Yeah, I just had two more comments. First of all, thank, thank you for doing this presentation. This is the first time I've been in a meeting where really get the information about the PAC. Um, it's been a long time since it was built, and so I appreciate the way you're managing it and what everybody's doing. Um, but my, my comment is, as we come out of COVID, which has been very difficult for everybody, and we go into budgets and looking at 2023 and 2024, I think we have to think outside the box and not think like we used to, because the PAC has to start making money. We, in my opinion, it can't be uh, a revenue source that we're feeding for the rest of our lives. So we need to think outside the box how we're going to use your expertise as managing this organization and the Parks and Rec Department and everybody else how to build this business up so we look at it and say it's revenue neutral at least. Um, that's just my personal opinions. but. I had a question about this security where you said it's going to cost $100,000, I think you said, mm -hmm. for the vandalism. Where is that money coming from? Did we allocate that out of budget or is that, I mean, that's the first time I've heard we're spending $100,000 for security. We're, we're not spending that. Oh, okay, If, good. if we were to have 24-hour oh, okay. security oh. with a private security company, that's what it would uh, cost. It's my hearing Cur aids. I currently, hear right well. now... Currently, right now, we have um, an agreement with a private security company that when we need them for events, we will hire you know Got two it. or okay. three officers. But also on non-event days, they patrol the lot three times um, throughout the evening between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, at random times to just check on okay. the property. Okay, good. I, I must have misheard that. I'm sorry. Thank you. We would love the $100,000, but... <laughs> <laughs> that needs to go to the bottom line. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. All right. Any, any further questions? All right. Thank you very much for a great uh, presentation, and, and thank you for answering uh, so many questions. I, I hope you didn't feel like you were being grilled or anything. Absolutely but, uh, not. But I guess that with uh, you know catering, I mean grilling is one option mm -hmm. with catering. So there you uh, go. Yeah, so anyway. Absolutely. No, we're, right. we're here to be transparent and answer <laughs> any questions that we have. So thank you very All much right. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, let's go on. The next and final um, item is a discussion on shopping carts. And uh, that's uh, something that, that as, as I see it, uh, you know, it, in, the last, in the last week, I have talked to the managers of eight different uh, stores, uh, the 312 Safeway, Costco, Home Depot, the 314th Walmart, Winco, Fred Meyer, Target, and Kohl's. And, and I think that, um, I, I think that most of us here on the dais agree that that uh, uh, we are here in Federal Way. We're handling the shopping cart situation better than many many cities do, and those store managers agree with that. However, there is uh, much much room for improvement, and uh, I had proposed a uh, a possible uh, ordinance, and I would like. Uh, uh, Joanna Eide to take a moment to tell me the, I, I understand there's some problems with my proposal. <laughs> and so uh, can you enlighten us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so happy to talk about the legal aspects of uh, shopping carts in Federal Way. Um, so, and I understand that the ordinance hasn't been formally proposed yet, it's just something that you've been um, thinking about. 
so I think where we might want to start is what the law exists as today. Um, so uh, currently, uh, the city of Federal Way, through ordinance, incorporates state law um, that prohibits theft of shopping carts. Uh, state law uh, does say, and it's in uh, RCW 9A56270, um, that it is unlawful to do any of the following acts if a shopping cart has a permanently affixed sign um, as provided in subsection 2 of the section. What that means is each of the shopping carts has to have a sign on it, essentially that cites to the statute, says it's unlawful to take this off the premises, and also have um, information identifying who the owner of the shopping cart is, meaning the, the retailer that you're talking about. Um, there is There are requirements that the person has to have the intent to deprive the owner of the use. That's fairly easy to, well, it's going to depend upon the facts and circumstances of each case, but um, can be fairly easy to prove as far as an element is concerned. Um, and then in our federal way city ordinance, um, we so we do incorporate that crime. It is a misdemeanor. It has a maximum penalty of up to 90 days in jail and up to $1,000 in fines or a combination of up to both. The up to is the important thing to remember with any of these things. Remember, this is a misdemeanor. Um, so it will be up to the court to decide what the up to amount is. <laughs> it could be something, it could be nothing, it could be one of the two or not at all. Um, and these things can uh, also take different courses as far as diversion or whatnot if they actually do become prosecuted. So. Um, in federal way, we do have um, ordinances that, number one, as I said, uh, incorporates that state law, so we are um, able to prosecute those within city limits and handle those through our courts. Um, but we also have a requirement in our ordinance that all of the businesses in, in um, the city of federal way carry those identification signs as required in state law. Um, and that is in federal way revised code uh, 725.030. Um, that entire ch uh, chapter, 725, so 7.25, um, does talk about uh, shopping carts, abandoned shopping carts specifically as well. Um, so there are some other things that are contained within that. Now, remember we're talking about abandoned shopping carts in that instance. We're not necessarily talking about shopping carts that are currently being possessed by a person. Um, so that's an important distinction to remember as well. Um, I know that uh, we also have uh, Deputy Chief Sumter here from our police department um, that can certainly talk about some of the enforcement parameters. I won't go too far down that path because I think it's more appropriately addressed directly by the police department. But there are some legal issues with if a shopping cart is currently being possessed by a person um, and contains their personal items, there are definitely some legal issues there that we have to um, deal with uh, if we are to cite a person for theft of a shopping cart, meaning that we would then have to be responsible for inventorying items and whatnot. And those, that, that, that goes back to a lot of legal requirements and a lot of constitutional requirements about this is the person's possessions. So um, I think that's kind of our top lines um, as far as where the law um, stands today. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about that, but um, if there's questions about enforcement, I think those are probably better addressed by our deputy chief. Okay. First, uh, Council Member Doby, if you have questions, yeah. and then we'll we'll turn some time to can Deputy I, Chief Sumter. Can I answer a couple of clarification? Absolutely. What you said. So you said that the court decides what the financial penalty is and the time in off the streets, in jail or wherever that is, right? That's correct. There okay. is a ceiling that is set, though, for each crime, yeah. and that is actually 90 days or $1,000. Mm -hmm. So how long does it typically take if that was going to be enforced? I mean, it was enforceable. It's a state law. Somebody's got a shopping cart. You know, you store their, their, store their goods. You take the cart. How long does it take to actually get the court? When would... What's, what's the, when does the penalty phase get decided and when does somebody find out that they're actually being prosecuted? I will give you the answer. Well, for when someone finds out when they're actually being prosecuted, it's whether or not they're cited directly okay. or if somebody receives notice that they have been, uh, that they were being charged with a crime. 
um, if they were not cited directly, they would receive that in the mail. Or so you could cite somebody on the spot? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So they've been cited. They know that they've done something against a state law. Right. So, so that is a possibility. Um, so as far as the time frame, as far as penalties, when they would go to court, that's, I'm going to give you the quintessential yeah, lawyer answer yeah, of yeah. it depends. It's grenade law. Um, it. So, uh, it, and it depends upon a variety of factors. It's going to depend upon whether or not the prosecutor is going to proceed with the case. It's going to depend upon, um, you know, whether or not the person wants to just plead guilty or if they want to contest it or if they want to go through diversion, if that's an option for them too. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that can play um, with that. It's also whether or not we can locate a person if we're not able to locate them if they don't appear in court. Um, so there's there's a lot of different factors there. It's really hard for me to say like average time for this and that just because of those okay. things. Um, so, and you so know, I, I get it. It's all over the board and you can't pin it down. <laughs> I understand that. But so, thankfully, sir, um, you know, we don't have. In the federal way, a municipal court, we don't have the same backlog that we do at the King County Court, for instance. Okay. Um, so it's not as long as okay. those. <laughs> and then my last question before I stop asking. Can, um, can I make a, just a follow up on, on that? Yeah. In, in the ideal world in federal way, <laughs> how quickly could it theoretically be? Oh, I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I, I would have to probably do some asking of our prosecutors um, and the court. Um, so, to, a matter of weeks or? Precisely. Um, I mean, folks have their speedy trial requirements. There's all sorts of different requirements that we have to adhere to. Someone has to, you know, these, these things have to move fairly quickly. Um, but if a person wants to come in and plead guilty, I mean, it can be over lickety split. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's fine. But um, if these things are contested, which, you know, they can oftentimes be, um, it could it could drag on for some time, and it really would then can depend upon the variety of factors, as I mentioned. Okay. I'm right, sorry. Me, can I ask my follow-up question? <laughs> now you can ask your okay, follow-up question. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, it's along the same line. So let's say that the city of Federal Way, one of our officers decides we have everything done. There's a guy with a card, a gal with a card, a little kid with a card, whatever it is, and they get cited with a citation. <laughs> and if we had somebody on staff that we paid for that had a little truck, it wasn't a sworn officer and a trailer picker upper and we had a, a storage unit that had all these cubicles where they could put the person's name could we pick the stuff up immediately right there on the spot have somebody that's not a sworn officer itemize all the possessions in the cart put them nicely into a container a box take it to our storage unit take the cart to our storage unit give the person their citation and say see you in court so that is a logistics question. I'm, just, there is, I'm, I'm, there is, I'm not asking about logistics. No. I'm just asking, is that well, legal? It, it is a logistics question because there's no difference between a government agent and a sworn police officer taking someone's stuff. We're, they're both operating. Well, there, there are employees. Right. Are, that we, and that's what I'm saying. As a government in, agent, it's a legal term. Oh, okay. um, I'm so sorry. anybody who is an employee of the city is operating on behalf of the government. Mm -hmm. Anytime the government does something to another person, there's a whole lot of rights that come into play. Our wonderful constitution says so. That's good. So, um, so that that differentiation is more of a logistics um, question. We would want to, of course, be very careful about what's evidence, what's personal property, and no, I, I get you that. know, and sometimes that might be hard to differentiate. So that might be a, again a better question for our deputy chief to answer as well. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. All right. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. So uh, I understand that from a community member that yesterday we did have someone in court here in Federal Way for having a shopping cart. And my um, my question is: Does the the cart have to <clears throat> remain in the custody of the city until the case is heard if someone is cited for that? And and chooses to go to court and and fight it and um, how and how did this one person I don't know all the specifics of the case but how was she selected from all the folks who push carts around the city to be cited for having a cart a shopping cart did she show up yes she showed up 
So um, I don't have the specifics of that case, so I wouldn't be able to tell you um, specifically. I work on the civil side primarily. I'm not involved in criminal prosecutions directly. Um, so I, I don't know what the rationale was, and that's generally speaking, that would be you know a variety of factors that would contribute to the officer determining whether or not citing that person would make sense. And Deputy Chief Sumter might be better for that question than me. Um, as far as release of the shopping cart itself, if it's needed for evidence, we would hang on to it. Um, but otherwise, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have to keep it. However, um, we do have ordinances on the book books that talks about returning of um, those shopping carts. So there would be, there wouldn't necessarily, if absent a need to keep it for evidence, which more likely than not, we probably don't need just okay. a picture will suffice. Um, but we, so we wouldn't have to do that, but there are some other considerations as far as getting those carts back to the legal owner. Um, and again, remember without those placards, um, we don't, sometimes can't confirm who that legal owner might be mm -hmm. um, because not all carts are marked. In fact, the vast majority of carts are not marked with those signs that have that information, which is another barrier to, or can be another barrier to this enforcement um, because that is a requirement of the criminal offense. So I think I may have touched could, on could but, Deputy oh. Chief answer the question <laughs> if he knows anything about it? Yes. I don't know anything about uh, the case you're referring to. I know we've had uh, two shopping cart enforcements over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. The one you're talking about, I don't know. If you've got a name or a case number, I can certainly find out the answer to that. Okay. Uh, on the other question, our preference would be take a picture and the person who shows up with a pickup truck, an employee of the city, we load the cart, we load the belongings, they take the cart, they return it to the owner. I mean, we take pictures for evidence. They take that cart, they drop it off. Now what do we do with all the property? That is really the, the second major hurdle. The other one is, has already been brought up. When I was sitting here a couple of weeks ago for a council meeting when Andy was gone, I was asked, would we do more enforcement of shopping carts if we had more police officers? And I said, well, if the carts are not signed per the RCW, Enforcement is a non-starter. It's not a question, it's not an option. And then the, the good gentleman who I appreciate because he supports public safety said they are marked, duly noted. So I went out and did my own survey and in the stores that I visited last week, I found a total of four carts that are appropriately marked. Only four? Only four out of hundreds of carts that I examined at the major stores. I found four total carts with appropriate markings. And that helps answer the question, why was this woman targeted? I, did, I didn't say she was targeted. Well, I, well targeted might be a, a poor choice of words on my part too, but why was she, why was her pushing of a cart enforced where hundreds of others around her are not? Her cart had the sign because again, it's a non-starter for all of those other carts and all those other people pushing carts. The cops aren't going to address it in the first place. Hers happened to be, she, she won the adverse lotto <laughs> by selecting that cart to load her belongings in. And that made her subject to enforcement while dozens of other people using them similarly or for similar reasons we're not in, are not enforced. So uh, I have a follow-up question to that. Yes, go ahead. So then do we need to, as a council to do something to work with the, the retail um, establishments to get them to mark their carts the correct way? That is the starter of enforcement right there. Now, I see an important distinction between the city's ordinance at 725 and the state, the RCW. The city ordinance is focused on businesses and their obligations, and there is nothing in the city ordinance directed at individuals for stealing or possessing or repossessing a shopping cart. The RCW is focused on the individual who would unlawfully steal or possess the cart. 
So there's an important distinction there. Businesses are already legally obligated by 725 mm -hmm. to put the RCW sign on all their carts. Now the question is for the policy group, do you want to sick the police officers on the businesses whose margins are already thin and start harassing, and harassing is a strong word too, but that's what it would be. Uniformed police officers going into businesses, Petco for instance, hey, I, you know, I see 52 carts, that's 52 violations of the city ordinance. Here's a citation to the manager times 52 counts, $1,000 each, or whatever it is going to add up to. You know, that doesn't sit well in the police department to start picking on business owners because they're not stealing their carts and pushing them around in encampments. And, and so that's a long answer to say yes. How do we gently get them to comply with the ordinance that is already requiring them to market? Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, in, in my visits with the, with the managers, uh, I found out that a lot of them, th there are some stores that uh, at some point in the distant or not so distant past had many of their carts marked. And over time, those have dwindled down to perhaps the four carts, you know. Uh, but they have not been very motivated to go to the trouble of, of, uh, of making sure that they're marked because they they've had the perception that it's not going to be enforced anyway, so why should we put the markings on the cart if it doesn't really matter? And so it's kind of a, a chicken and an egg type situation where we can't enforce it if they're not marked, but they're not marking it because they don't think it's going to be enforced, and so, you know, so we're, we're kind of uh, at a stalemate there. I think that if we were able to send a, if we did send a message to them, not able to send a message, but if we did send a message by action of the city council that hey if you mark the carts it will indeed be enforced you know and set something up where uh you know as you're saying a, and, and and as council member Dovey said we have some other uh city personnel packing stuff up so the the, the law enforcement officer isn't there for an extended period of time Packing up the personal belongings of uh, of John Q. Homeless, uh, you know, and and if we got that message to the store managers, I think that there would be a, a difference that if it was actually going to be enforced. Also, I would suggest that uh, to the policy group that we do something where right now they need to pay twenty five dollars to retrieve their carts. I would suggest that if the cart is properly marked, that that $25 fee be waived, and that will provide additional incentive for them to mark their cards. May I make another observation? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that idea. It incentivizes compliance. Enforcement of these shopping carts, especially insofar as businesses are concerned, occurs in two ways, or as, as far as the city is concerned. We are mostly talking about enforcement on the individual who unlawfully possesses the cart. But the city has been enforcing shopping carts. You just mentioned it cost $25 to get it back. We've been collecting carts for many years and returning them and imp impounding and, re and, and charging them to get their carts back. That type of enforcement has been going on for many years. So for managers to say the city does no enforcement, therefore what do I care? Yeah, that's, that's talking about this part of the story, not what we've been doing with and for them for many years. Certainly we haven't been arresting people for possessing shopping carts unlawfully, uh, but that has also largely been what do we do with their property? And we're talking about that right now because I see that we've got at least three options. Police officer sees the, sees the sign on a car. Oh, she's getting it. Here I go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop her. Pulls over and l l arrest is one thing. That's the biggest hammer. But let's just go with the citation. 
Officer rolls up, sees, yep, it's got the language on the sign, takes a picture for evidence. Now I have to find out if they have complied. Part of the sign <coughs> is, how do they lawfully remove a cart from the property? And the ones at Safeway that are marked say, you must get prior written consent before removing it. That's how you lawfully take the cart. So I have to have an interview that says, do you have prior written consent to remove the cart? They have no obligation to answer the question. They have a Fifth Amendment right to refuse. But let's say in an optimal scenario, they say, no, I didn't get prior written consent. All right, good. Now I have probable cause to believe uh, you've taken, plus which, the intent to deprive. So if there's a bunch of goods from that store currently in the basket, uh, maybe they're not intending to deprive yet. Maybe they're going to dump it, uh, take their bags home, and then return it. I don't know. But if they have converted it to personal use, that's where I would say they've crossed the line of intent. And as Joanna said, that's where it starts to get kind of easy to show intent. Now I'm going to issue the citation. Here's your citation. Now comes a decision point on what to do with the property. One option is, man, this property is going to be a big headache. And this is on a weekend night. And the one person for the city only works Monday through Friday 40 hours. And there's nobody with a pickup truck now who can come and get this cart and collect the property and book it and store it and everything else. So, all right, dump your cart out. I can leave all that junk piled on the sidewalk or off the sidewalk and just leave it there and somehow return the cart, call for a police pickup truck and say, okay, return the cart. But what about the junk I've just caused on the sidewalk? Option number two, the police department has a bunch of big Tupperware bins. So when we're doing the shopping cart enforcement, they dump it into these bins that don't have wheels and then we return the shopping cart and now the offender is left with three or four or five large Tupperware bins, but no wheels. What are they going to do? I think we're about to create the next set of problems for the city to try to solve. Whereas when it's in that shopping cart and it's on wheels, we have options. So am I going to leave the person with the unlawful cart? Here's your citation. I got my evidence pictures. Here's your citation. There's my enforcement. I get a stat. But the rest of this is too big of a hassle that's going to take me too much time, and I don't want a junk pile on the side of the street. So you keep that cart until you find what to do with your property, and then you take it back, would you please? That's an option. I'm not sure it solves anything, though. So we end up in this hamster wheel that's hard to climb off of because one set of solutions creates another problem for us to solve. And, all right, so that's kind of the picture of where we're at. Council President Coach Well, it would appear to me that the solution would be not to allow them to take the cart in the first place. And one way to do that, of course, is for the store to have electronic monitoring so that cart cannot be removed from the premises. And we do have some of our stores that do do that. Uh, is that, for example, Target. I mean, Target allows them to take their carts off premise because they believe they don't want to lose the um, uh, people who are actually purchasing it to go to a bus stop or something. So I, it, I'm wondering what problem, have you talked to the businesses about the electronic? Yes, and, and I have talked to them. Uh, one of the, there's some challenges with the, the electronic uh, method. Uh, in talking to the manager of the 314th uh, uh, Walmart, he uh, said that they had been considering doing that there. Uh, the Renton Walmart, in, in Renton, the city of Renton apparently uh, mandates that they have electronic locks on them. And, the, and so the uh, Walmart in Renton has that. And they actually lose more carts than what the city of Federal Way does because some way they are taking, switching wheels out or whatever and, and are, are breaking the locking mechanism 
And so it is not a foolproof system. And so there's challenges with that system as well. Uh, you know, the, the little bit of information that I did collect is that uh, it costs, uh, well, for one of the stores, it costs about $50,000 to create the system to begin with, and then it's about $200 additional for each cart to, to outfit the cart with those, with those wheels. Uh, Can you imagine trying to do that for Target at the mall? They would have to contain the entire mall property yeah. with these electronic stoppages yeah. in order to prevent it from, because you could shop in, in Target and push your cart all the way down the mall to the opposite end of the mall where you parked when you came into the mall and have, the, it's not just out the main doors of Target. Yeah, as I say, with the mall, I mean, they do, the, with Target, the ones that uh, that are, uh, have the electronic locks on them, if they go into the rest of the mall, it locks up, so they can't do it. That's but true. if it goes into the parking lot, and all of a sudden we have a situation where instead of Target having to put that perimeter in, it would probably be Merlin Geyer having to put the perimeter in, because there's... Such a, a huge parking lot. It's a huge, huge par parking lot. And it probably wouldn't be $50,000, it would be a multiple of that. And so there are challenges with that as, as well. Ross has that rod, the long thing, that you can't leave and nobody complains. So mm -hmm. maybe everybody can go that I, way. I, I think the one, one challenge with the, with the long pole is that Ross, I mean, people are, are getting some lighter things. I mean, if you have a grocery cart full Full, full of items, you need to get it out to the car. And so that's a, a challenge there. If they help you. So, all right. All right, Council Member Dovey, you have. Yeah, I, got a, I just have a couple clarifying questions that the Chief's brought up. Um, I, heard, I think I heard you say that the City of Federal Way law and the state law aren't in sync. We have two different um, playing fields. One is let's call it prosecution of the individual and we have one in the city of federal way which is prosecution of the business owner they're not synced together in any way is that correct i mean not prosecution is maybe the wrong yeah word, i wouldn't not, say that they're, they're not they're synced. Not, they complement each other complement, actually but, but they don't yeah. actually go together one they're not doing the same things right they're they're one's to make sure shopping carts aren't left around the town is the way I kind of look at it. One is to make it so somebody who takes a shopping cart unauthorized shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So there might be some syncing that we need to do so it's pretty streamlined. Looks so, like Joanna is anxious to comment. <laughs> Very, <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Joanna. Uh, so we already incorporate state law into our city code by reference. Well, so that's how it already exists within our city code. We are able to enforce it as it stands. Um, so we don't have to reiterate what's already in state law. It's already part of okay. Federal Way City Code. So, and we also have the complementary um, abandoned shopping carts provisions in okay. Chapter 725. Okay. That okay. one provision that talks about the requirement for those signs to be on the carts, that is meant to make it easier for us to be able to have the enforcement of the state law. Yeah that we incorporate by reference to. I know it's a little yeah, weird, so, but it's so, so we don't have to keep on, every time they change the law at the state level, then we don't have to actually go through and type out all of the changes into the code. Well, it's, so. it's really apparent to me that the non-starter on this whole thing is if they don't have the, the proper wording on the cart, I mean, we're just wasting everybody's time talking about it. So it's got to start there. But the thing that I'm just thinking about, you made the comment you come up to a shopping shopping cart and we know how big they are and most people don't have two I've seen a couple guys in town with three but most of them have one and you know we got 24 7 seven days a week which is in my world of business that's probably four people to be able to manage 24 7 um, enforcement or picking up stuff after the officers done their job so it really comes down to me as I think about it if we're really serious about this this is not only a policing issue and a store owner issue it's a budget issue because we can't expect our police officers to itemize everything and take them down to the storage unit 
and if we really want to get into this, it's going to cost probably a quarter million dollars in people time, infrastructure, so that you can have a handoff, even if you can. I heard that maybe you can't, but where somebody other than our officer itemizes it, packs it up in a box, takes it to a safe storage unit, and, you know, that's probably what, what we're really talking about, yeah. if you think about it, because <coughs> that's what it's, yeah. their officers aren't going to take it down. We don't want them off the streets doing that. Yeah. No, I, but I, I think that if we, you know, our existing employees that, that, uh, that pick up the carts to begin with, I mean, have them we, as, we as in, 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 in the hours that they are on duty, and the officers can know, basically, hey, if it's at 1 o'clock in the morning, if somebody's going down the par car with the cart and it's properly marked, hey, they got a freebie. You know, but we're, we're not going we're, we're to cite them. But if it's at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and our staff is on, on duty, then we can go ahead and, and do it, and it's not taking the officer's time. We're not having to drastically increase the budget. We're having to have a, a smaller budget for a, a storage unit or whatever, but it's not uh, hiring a, a whole staff of people to enforce this. And, and I think that, that after it's been enforced for actually actively enforced for a little bit, that the, that the need for enforcement will reduce yeah. in, the, in the months following that. But, yeah. but once again, it comes back to, uh, back to uh, the stores yeah. marking the carts appropriately. And, and, and uh, Chair Walsh, I am I'm not opposed to spending the money. I think that if we already have two and we go hire a third so we can do something like this, I think it's money well spent. We have people coming to our council meetings, every meeting since I've been elected since uh, the first year talking about this. Um, and so if we can come up with a humane way to enforce the, the law that benefits the shop, the citizens, and everybody, and I don't know what that looks like, we should at least try starting. And it is going to cost us money. As long as we understand that, then, you know, that will be a, a vote up and down on how to do it. But we need to do something to minimize what's going on on the streets. I agree with you 100%. Okay. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda has been waiting very patiently, and then uh, Council Member, Member Seth Uh Thank you. So I understand there are at least three stores that hire a private company to pick up their carts. Has that reduced the amount of carts that we're picking up? Yeah, it has. And why did they do that? So well, we, we believe um, the numbers dropped after our 2018 ordinance was put into place. So prior to that, volunteers were going around. The numbers when we were picking up with them were much higher than they are now. And we can only, we can only speculate, but the, but the ordinance is intended to incentivize stores to get the carts before the city does, because if they don't, then it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fee. And so what we have seen, like what you have said, is we have seen uh, retrieval services going throughout the city uh, before our crew goes out, and in many instances getting the carts before we do, and that's reduced the number of carts that we have impounded that has then have to return to stores. Yeah. So do we need then um, from the council something and a stricter ordinance that says that there will be something, the store will have to do something if they don't have their carts properly labeled. And I don't think that's something that the city should pay for. The carts do not belong to the city, so I don't know that we could even legally pay for that. Um, because that sounds like that's the number one issue. And then the other issues would be, would police even have time to do this? And where would their belongings go? And that which are two huge issues. Um, you know, the other thing that I was thinking is, I've been in um, states where you have to put in like a quarter or something to get a shopping cart out. And you get the quarter back when you put the shopping cart back into the, um, the corral. And I, maybe we want to do that. Maybe that would just be easier to do something like that, require stores to do that. I, I, I think that with the offenders that people were talking about, they're not worried about that quarter. I mean, they're they want the shopping cart for their for their use. 
So I, I don't think it, it's not like at a at an airport with the baggage retrieval things where you where you're basically renting them for a little while. Um, it's but you have a captive location. I mean, it's here. You know, it's they're taking them out to the woods and. They don't care about their quarter or dollar or anything else. There are sometimes I've gone by some stores where there are many, many carts left outside. Oh yeah. And if the stores had a, I don't know. Sometimes I just wonder if they're that concerned as as other people are about where their carts are. Can okay, can I make a comment before? Uh, in in talking to the to the store owners, I mean they. Basically, the shopping cart situation, say with uh, over with Fred Meyer, and the one in Target is very very different. In Fred Meyer, most of the shopping carts that are disappearing are disappearing as they are pushed out the store with a load of the store's merchandise that was not purchased. And you know, basically, as, as I say, it probably uh, organized retail crime. Where with the uh, and and there's a little bit of the of it the shopping carts that are going into the homeless population, but that's the biggest problem is is that uh, for for Fred Meyer, where with Target and with the 314th uh, uh, Walmart and with the 320th Safeway, it's more the the the, the challenges with the homeless pop population. And so there's different there's a different demographic. Over there, that's taking the carts than what it is over here, and and, and that may play into it some. So, Councilmember Asafa Dawson. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So, at the end of the day, what we want to do is not have carts outside, right? Well, I mean, carts can certainly go out to the the the, you know, the part of the purpose of them is to go out and deliver the goods to their cars, their automobiles, so they can take them home and they put them, uh, you know, back in the cart place. And, and uh, But the, the carts should not be leaving the premise of the, uh, of the building. So my concern is, and as uh, Deputy Mayor said, you know, when you prosecute people who already don't have any, any funds or money, how does that even, you know, if, it, if there's a penalty or a fee, it's not going to be met. So those penalties are not going to stop people from using these carts or taking carts or taking them out because it's. I don't think it's a deterrent because they're not going to be able to pay it anyway. So it, it, it's not going to matter. So we should. We need to find another way of incentivizing not taking the carts, rather than making it punitive to where I don't have the money and I'm not going to do it anyway. Yeah. Right. So. I, I think that, that with that, I mean, uh, part of it is, is if it goes to community court and our judges here, I mean, I think we have some, a couple of excellent, excellent judges, and uh, they can, uh, if, you know, most of the people would probably not have the money for the fine. The, the, the population that we're talking about would right. not have the money for the right. fine. But, uh, you know, hopefully in the future there will be some funds available where they could, the judge could say, hey, you want to spend some time in jail, or would you like to go into a diversion program with drug treatment, you know, and and uh, be able to help them that way? And uh, but but I think that part of it is as as I see it that there's threefold purpose of what we're trying to do. One is reduce the theft of carts from the stores. Number two is make our city less unsightly with not having carts all around, and number three is addressing the situation with, uh, with the, the homeless addicts and mentally ill people where either they can get some help or they will find Federal Way a less pleasant place to be and they will decide to go elsewhere. And, but, but, but ideally, I mean, you know, I, mean, you know I, I wish that the state were providing funds where, for mental health and addiction recovery programs where where that could be more of a realistic option, that is my perspective. But, but if uh, I don't have any addiction and I'm taking a car because I'm homeless or I don't have anywhere to take my stuff, what happens? I'll go, I go to jail because I don't need those services. So should we focus more on housing? But I, I'm, I'm 
I, I hear you and I don't like it either, but I think we got to talk about ways to minimize that rather than it being so punitive because now we're putting the burden on police to take care of it. We're also, the person tomorrow can do the same thing again. So are you gonna continuously um, go after them for taking carts because they have so much stuff to carry? So I feel like we're, we're addressing an issue that can't be addressed that way. So, and I don't know what the solution is, but I'm, I'm struggling with how we're trying to solve the problem when that is really not the issue or the underlying problem. So um, I think we should explore more solutions. You know, I, I so. think that the issue with, with, the, with the great greater part of the homeless population is not a matter, I mean, that, it, hey, in the state we have a housing crisis, but the homelessness crisis and the housing crisis are two separate issues. And the, the greater, by far the greatest part of the homelessness crisis isn't a matter of housing, it's a matter of addiction and mental health. And, and, uh, and that's one thing that needs to be addressed that unfortunately the city cannot address as much as what I personally would like it to. So. I just wanna make a follow up comment up on what Lydia said, because she does bring a, an interesting perspective to this and I think it's something that's important that we think about. We have shopping carts, which are the symptom of the many issues. Could be homeless, I mean, I can't afford a home, I've got mental health issues, I've got drug issues, or I just don't respect the law. There's a whole bunch of things that go on. And it seems to me if you start with something small and make it a priority, like a shopping cart, but don't start stop there, because we do need to do things like, where do people go that truly want help so they can get housed? And the shopping cart to me is just the, the pinpoint of a symptom, of the problem and a symptom, but if you get the if you get one thing knocked off and you have a, a workable program, then you can start work on the next one is, okay, I'm not gonna take this shopping cart, but I need a place to live, so what's the city's role in things we read about like tiny houses and different places or whatever it is, but we start to, like when we were all kids, our parents trained us on what to do, how to do it, how to tie our shoes, how to get up, and some shopping carts could be that's the very simple thing to start the whole process to get to where we really want to be or where society talks about is giving everybody the chance to better themselves, to support themselves, to um, have a place to live. But shopping carts is kind of the lightning point as I see it. And if we could fix that little bit somehow, then we get that <laughs> off the list and we start working on the next one and the next one and just keep moving up the level, up the line. But I think, I do think we have to do something because you know, it's probably the same, I don't know, pick a number, 100, 50, 75. I mean, you probably can go up and down the streets and find out who the offenders are that are <coughs> using shopping carts as their main source of transportation and living. It's not the old person or the young person taking the cart from Target to go to the bus to take their stuff home. It's the habitual people that are going up and down the street that we all run into every day. and. I think we just have to be incrementally get one thing good and then go to the next one. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with that. Uh, Deputy Mary Hon Mayor Honda. I would say that the first thing we need to do is find a way to have the stores label their shop shopping carts because nothing I else agree will happen with you, if we don't do that. So we need to come up with a solution. Would, I mean, as, as a small part of that, I mean, what is the consensus of the others here on the council with the idea that if they are properly labeled, that we waive that $25 retrieval fee. If I may, um, Mr. Chair, uh, so we do have that in our ordinance already, um, that they, if they do have um, things signed and security measures in place and whatnot, so some of those items that you listed earlier, the polls or a person who's monitoring those sorts of things, they can get a deferral on um, fees for those abandoned shopping carts. I think it's up to three. If they go to four, then they don't get any more for, per month, excuse me. So um, so that is something that's already there, but um, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be something policy-wise that the council made. Yeah, and, and also I, I don't think that's been communicated to the, uh, to the stores. Uh, none of the, of the store managers that I spoke with were even aware 
of anything like that. And so I, I think there is a, a problem with communications. Uh, also, with, with there's a, yes. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, we, it was the store owners that helped us develop the policy, so it's probably a turnover in managers that don't know yeah, about it. Yeah, so, probably so. That's not so. something that we created, so I, I do need to defend the, the ordinance a little bit on that regard because it was, it was their suggestion that we put that incentive in there. Also, I think they we're talking about two different things. One is the security measures that, that gets the fee deferral, and then you're talking about the signage, which is also uh, mm -hmm. in the ordinance. Um, to your question about can can you waive the fee if they have the signage on there? Answer is yes, but then the the funding for the program, not that that's the the, the reason that we're here, but the funding for the program goes away, and so we would need to uh, to Council Member Dovey's cost uh, point. It's a cost uh, yeah. issue at that point. Yeah, and and I think it's a cost that that if if it will clean up the city and do things make things better, it's a cost well worth bearing. Um, I, I do also need to say, you know, so say we do get signs on all the carts. I, I, I assume that the that the um, that the hope then is is enforcement after that point. So if all all carts have signs on it, then there can be enforcement, and then it's a matter of 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 staff um, retrieving the carts that have the the signs on it, or or imposing some sort of penalty to the person carrying it. Um, you, 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 Chair Walsh, you mentioned earlier that it's a, it's a mere expansion of the current personnel that go out and retrieve the carts, and I just want to be clear that the current staff that retrieve carts do not engage with any cart that is occupied, meaning that if the person has the cart in their possession, the, the shopping cart technicians are, they're, they're not police officers. They're not intended to not be in an uh, emotionally stable situation. So if there is needs to be engagement with the person, it's it's an expansion of the police. Yeah, and and I think that I think that that's I, I thought that that was understood. It would be the police that would be doing it, and then calling the shopping cart tech then to 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 take it and to, to take yes. whatever. But but the police would be the ones that would be there uh, handling things with the the. Uh, uh, Offender. Yes, and then finally, um, on that, just kind of taking that a bit further, you, you talked about three things uh, that that were the result of, of the police taking action. The last of which was incarceration, and so I just want to um, be clear that um, that is that's a big step for the city <laughs> to then devote police resources yeah. to incarcerate shopping yeah. cart. You know, I, I think that this is, is realistically, it's more a, a case of, you know, I, I think that this is, is realistically, it's more a, a case of, of the community court being able to, um, you know, it, it, this is a case, you know, a few months ago we were talking about diversion programs a lot. And, and the diversion programs is sometimes not applied to the right people. I think that this would be more of a case for some type of diversion program, rather than some of the felony things that are getting uh, diversion by the uh, diversion. Is that a word? Uh, diversion by the county prosecutor. So, so, yes. Well, it would. You know, this is on for information only, and it would appear to me that we seem to be in agreement that we should um, require that all the shopping carts have a notice on them. So, how, you know, how, what's what's the next step? Do we? Put this on the agenda for the next meeting. Do we, for a discussion as well, on uh, do we send a letter? I mean, you know, because this is information we can't take. Right. Action. So, so it, it, it is a current requirement that they have the the markings on the carts. It's a, it's a matter of enforcement. And so, um, if, if if we want to then um, punish the stores for not having signs, um, the big stores will weather it a lot better than the, than the small stores. And that's, that's the feedback. I don't know if that was anything that you had encountered, uh, Chair Walsh, in your outreach. But our out outreach was any type of regulation or, or punishment to the stores uh, is going to affect the smaller stores more. So what I would recommend um, is that, that we staff start to reach out to the stores, remind them of the ordinance, and give them a time period in which they would have uh, a period of time to rotate their inventory of carts out mm -hmm. and not something that is immediate. Right. Um, because that uh, otherwise it's a cost that they unlikely would be able to, the, again, the smaller stores yeah. would unlikely be able to bear. So give them a certain time period um, 
that, that would allow them to, to budget and, man and mm -hmm. prepare for that um, switch. Yeah. I, I think if a letter went out to the store saying that, hey, d defining how they are supposed to be placarded or marked, you know, what, what needs to be on there, how it should be done, and then saying that this will indeed be enforced if they are properly marked. And because right now the perception with all of the stores is why should we mark them? It's not being enforced anyway. Sure. And so, but, but let them know it will be enforced if it's properly marked. And then also, I, I think that we should formalize waiving the, the, the $25 retrieval fee for carts that are properly marked. I mean, do, you know, I, I think the carrot is more uh, effective than the stick. Yeah. So uh, the, the program is about an $80,000 cost to the city. And so if we do waive the fees for the signs, then that's, that's a cost that we would need to recoup elsewhere because right now that is a uh, some uh, it's a program that pays for itself and again not that we're here to try to uh, fund anything but if if we do want to use that as an incentive we'll need to make up for it elsewhere if we're still intending to yeah. have cart retrieval services yeah. provided by so, the city so Jack we'd have to have a, a vote on that because we that would be a change to that that would be a change yeah. and so, so we need so to, to have currently if you are just going to move forward with what he's proposing is you know, start enforcing what we've already doing and send out a letter, then we don't need any further action here. We just need to move forward with reminding staff to contact the stores. Yeah, uh, with the with the, the waiving the $25 fee, would that take action by the, require action by the? Because it's a fee schedule. I think it might even be in the ordinance, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that would, that would take um, an adjustment yeah. to the ordinance itself, um, and I'd be happy to shoot you where that would be at. I can follow okay. up with you. Okay. Um, if that is something that you wanted to pursue. Uh, if I could add one thing, sorry. Yeah. Um, before we send a letter out saying do this, we're going to enforce it, which I'm not against, but I want to really make sure we got the back end figured out because listening to the chief about how are we going to pick these up, what are we going to, how we're going to categorize it, where we're going to store it, I mean, that's got to be baked before we. Yeah. Yeah. Can, and can, so that's, I mean, we're talking about it, and I think we need to, and we should make a decision. The staff needs, to, as Linda said, bring us kind of what it looks like. But that back end of what we're going to do, if we're going to enforce something, that's got to be ironclad, and it's got to be really yeah. thought through, and yeah. it has to be made sure it's not going to break, because if it does, we're wasting everybody's yeah. time. It, it needs to be in place before a letter goes out. So, Well, I, I think we could send the letter for the stores. That, that's one issue, mm -hmm. um, um, and then get those that, that fleet of carts rotated out. The, the question of enforcement of those that possess the carts off-site, but, but if, if, that's, if, that's, that's your but if, that's but if your you question. Send, if you send that letter out, we're going to enforce this, then they're going to the, the, they're gonna expect us to enforce their carts being gone, and we're not ready to do that. That's what I'm yeah. – I mean, we haven't thought – I mean, sure. I mean, it has, it has been on the books for four years, so I, I know, don't know but if you have an argument that we're... I but, know but, we, we got to get it right, but we can't yeah. start taking... So, yeah. first so, of all, we need to find out how often they replace their carts. If, if we're going to give them a, a time, I would say at least six months, maybe even longer. Hopefully by that time we have more police on the force, because I know that we're actively hiring uh, police officers. Um, but we are coming up to a really busy time for staff. And uh, I don't want to pressure staff too much to create a new pro. This would actually be a new kind of a new program because we would need to have uh, the ability to store their uh, belongings. And um, um, <clears throat> anyway, I. You, you, you're, you're correct. It is. It's a, an expansion of an, an existing program, and that requires storage and inventorying and cataloging mm -hmm. all the stuff. And if we're taking fees away, then it's it's an expansion of a program while taking away the funding of the existing program. So we need to. But, there needs to be some some more work. For, I think from staff on telling us as a council what the cost will be and how how this will be done, so that we know um, how staff will handle this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, six, six months is probably way too long, though. I mean, yeah, I, from, from from my perspective, I mean, as soon as the things can get worked out between, figure out how to coordinate. I mean, have have the storage, 
figure out how to coordinate things between the police department and the staff that would be doing it. As soon as that's done, then a letter could go out and we could begin enforcing and just letting the stores know that, that hey, as you, as you get the placards on the carts, this will be enforced. Can you bring this and back to the next uh, parks meeting in September? Because everybody will be gone in August. Yeah. Would September okay. give you enough time? Yeah, we can do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. But we don't Thank agree you. on enforcement yet, right? We need to know what that looks like. So. Yeah, he's going to bring it back. Yeah. So. Uh, which enforcement piece are you referring <coughs> to, council members? If that's for um, people who are using the carts. Yeah. So the people. And so I mean, ultimately, that's the. We can, uh, not to be flippant here, but we can talk all day about signs and retrieval services. Ultimately, we're talking about what happens to the person. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And what are we prepared to do to that person? Correct. That's, that's, I mean, if we're talking frankly, that's the discussion we need to have. Correct. Yeah. And, and with that, I mean, the person that was in court today, what, she, you know, and if there has been a couple of them in court recently, what, how, how did, what was the outcome there? I, I think if uh, we should actually add um, the courts into this discussion too, because if we, if we do, enforce this and community court is going to be the solution for the folks who are cited will the courts be able to handle that yeah depending on how many people are are cited so i, I think that there needs to be a discussion with the courts oh. so can staff do that yeah, for september by the september meeting yeah. okay all right any other questions Comments? No, yes. but I think Mr. and Mrs. Is it Riddle? Yeah. yeah, I think you just need to understand that um, the annex, still like annex, will be discussed at our next council meeting on July 19th. You've been sitting here so patiently, and I felt badly that you didn't know it was going to be on this agenda. So, so. But thank th you. Th thank you for being here. <laughs> it, it's, it's nice to not to have an empty room. <laughs> so. Um, well, it is parks, right? Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> okay all right so our uh let's see so our next meeting will be uh in september september what date september 13th okay all right september 13th we will not be having the august one because the council meeting will be this week in august so, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>